Welcome to the Big Book Roundtable in the RICO 12 family of recovery resources. We work with people from all backgrounds, faiths, and places dealing with addictions of all varieties. We don't uh, discriminate here. Everybody's welcome to join in and get the solution out of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, RICO 12 is, an, is a really cool resource. We have lots of services and resources out there in the forms of podcasts and opportunities to serve and learn from, from each other. So I'm grateful to be here in this uh, roundtable, joined by David G. and Nikki M. as we strive to walk this path of recovery in our lives. Um, I'd like to quickly have each of them introduce themselves. David, why don't you jump in here and introduce yourself and tell us um, what's happening today in your life. Awesome. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Nikki. My name's David G. from Oklahoma. I'm a grateful alcoholic and, and recovered addict. I've uh, been in the rooms uh, since 1994 and uh, just really, really grateful to be here with you guys today. Um, just having some great family time, uh, really feeling the uh, the connection with my with my creator, uh, just walking this path. I've uh, recently came back through some steps, cleaned up some things in my life, resentments and fears and made what amends I needed to. And there again, there's the power. And I just love this deal. Really glad to be here today. Thank you. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. Nikki, you're up. Oh, I've been unmuted this whole time. This is awesome. Hi, I'm Nikki M. And I'm a grateful member of this beautiful fellowship. And I'm just so grateful. What have I been up to lately? Well, I'm getting ready. I, I live two lives because God is big. And I have, you know, my life in Europe and I have my life here. So I have about three weeks before I leave for a month, Justin. So I'm getting everyone through through the steps. I'm getting everything done because, you know, the big holiday is coming up. So I want everyone, I want all my ducks lined up in a row. row. But guess what? My creator might have another plan and I'm cool with whatever's thrown at me. Thank you. Thanks, Nikki. I, I If this were a different podcast we were doing, I would dig in there and make you explain that a little bit more about having to give into the creator's plan and submit to that. But we're going to move on in this and talk more about the big book today. And I'm, I didn't introduce myself very much. I'm Justin. I'm a recovering addict from Spokane, Washington. And you know, in my life, I am uh, gratefully going with the flow in directions that were definitely not in my plan, but in directions that I trust that my creator has in store for me. And it's a, uh, it, it's adventurous to say the least, and I'm excited for the adventure. I'm putting my hands in the air on the roller coaster and and enjoying the ride. So, all right, today we're gonna jump. We're gonna continue in the doctor. I'm sorry, in Bill's story. Continue in Bill's story. Last time we, last uh, episode, we uh, finished up uh, the paragraph on page seven that ends with "Surely this was the answer." Self knowledge. We discussed a little bit about Bill and how he had done all these different things and learned so much about himself. And he was so sure that this is the answer. And now we're going to finish, we're going to finish off page seven and move on to page eight. Going down through the sentence that ends in uh, more wonderful as time passes. Okay. Let's get into the reading here. Once again, the last sentence from last episode read, surely this was the answer self knowledge. And how we're going to start on the next paragraph. But it was not. For the frightful day came when I drank once more. The curve of my declining moral and bodily health fell off like a ski jump. After a time, I returned to the hospital. This was the finish. The curtain, it seemed to me. My weary and despairing wife was informed that it would all end with heart failure during delirium tremens, or I would develop a wet brain perhaps within a year. She would soon have to give me over to the undertaker, or the asylum. They did not need to tell me. I knew and almost welcomed the idea. It was a devastating blow to my pride. I, who had thought so well of myself and my abilities, of my capacity to surmount obstacles, was cornered at last. Now I was to plunge into the dark, joining that endless procession of sots who had gone on before. I thought of my poor wife. There had been there had been much happiness after all. What would I not give to make amends? But that was over now. No words can tell of the loneliness and despair I found in the bitter morass of self-pity. Quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. I had been overwhelmed. 
Alcohol was my master. Trembling, I stepped from the hospital, a broken man. Fear sobered me for a bit. Then came the insidious insanity of that first drink, and on, on, and on Armistice Day 1934, I was off again. Everyone became resigned to the certainty that I would that I would have to be shut up in somewhere or would stumble along to a miserable end. How dark it is before the dawn. In reality, that was the beginning of my last debauch. I was soon to be catapulted into what I like to call the fourth dimension of existence. I was to know happiness, peace, and usefulness in a way of life that is incredibly more wonderful as time passes. All right, some really good stuff in here, and uh, I'm excited to hear a little bit more about what your takeaways are on this. David, why don't you start us off and go through that reading a little bit with uh, some further depth and insight you that you have there. Oh, yeah, absolutely, Justin. I'm always so grateful for you and your service here. Thank you so much. Uh, we're, we're talking, this is where Bill finally, finally finds bottom. And if you're anything like us, and Nikki says all the time, I'm Bill. Well, I'm like Bill as well. Just because I found this bottom, which is step one, that's going to be described there on page eight. This is where he took the first step. Without a solution, we'll always drink or do whatever it is again, just as he did. And um, he believes that self-knowledge is the answer, but as you read, it's not. The frightful day come whenever we'll drink again, no matter how much we know about ourselves, no matter how much I know about this book, no matter how intelligent I am. I know a lot of people that are pretty intelligent, but they're not very smart. And I know a lot of smart people that are not very intelligent. So it really has nothing to do with any of that. It just doesn't. So he drinks and his it, the declining moral of his bodily health, it falls off like a ski jump, he says. So after a time, he returns to the hospital. Remember, this is Towns Hospital that we're talking about. And he overhears a conversation between his wife and Dr. Silkworth. Now, in those days, you had three opportunities to come into Towns Hospital and to recover. You would get the best treatment available of that day. Now, after the third time, with the family's consent, Dr. Silkworth would send you upstate New York to a wet burn clinic where you would never return to normal society again. You would do what I have known as the Thorazine shuffle. You would walk around a little circle in pajamas, and this would be your life. And this is where Bill was when this experience happened to him. You can see it right there. He said, my weary and despairing wife was informed by who? By Silkworth. That it had all end with heart failure during the DTs, or he would develop a wet brain. Perhaps within a year, she'd soon have to turn him over to the undertaker of the asylum. So Bill says, they don't need to tell me. I almost welcome the idea. And see, that's the key word there, idea. So it's always a devastating blow to our pride whenever self has beat us to this point in our life. And Bill said, I, who had thought so well of myself and my abilities, and just because I think well of myself and my abilities doesn't mean that that's, that's the truth. I can't differentiate the truth from the false. So let's look how he falls into self-pity. And this is exactly what I do when I'm cornered like this. His uh, capacity to surmount obstacles were cornered. Now I'm going to plunge into the dark with that endless procession of saucers going on before. You know, I mean, all this pity. Oh, now I'm going to think about my poor wife. Oh, my God, I haven't thought about her all this time. But now all of a sudden, oh, I'm thinking about my wife. And I can remember in 2019, whenever I was discovered for lust and all the ramifications of the life that I'd lived with that for many years in recovery. Oh, all of a sudden now I thought about my wife. There had been a lot of happiness. And but look what he says, I, what I would not give to make amends. How can you make amends? He, he hasn't even bottomed out with the first step yet. He's about to. But he's a long way from amends. If I try to make amends at this stage of the game. I'm doing it with self. I'm doing it with the intellect. And so it's it's going to be worthless anyway. But here's where he took the first step in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. No words can tell of the loneliness, despair. I found the bitter morass of self-pity, quick trans, quick sand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. I had been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. And when we get to that point that something else has become our master, then that's the first step. But then again, he has no solution at this point. Remember, he hasn't met Ebby. 
the Oxford Group principles hasn't come to him. This is all he knows is the bodily and the mentally. And it's not enough. It's just never going to be enough. So he steps from the hospital, a broken man, fear sobers him for a bit. Remember back on page seven, he'd got, surely his answer was self-knowledge. That was the first time he sobered up. This time he's going to sober up on fear. Anybody out there could relate to this. So the insanity of the first drink shows up again on our mess to stay 34. That's November the 11th of 1934. He run, he's gone again. He's in relapse. So he says, everyone becomes resigned to the certainty I'll have to be shut up somewhere or stumble along to a minute. And I love this, how dark it is before the dawn, no matter how bad it is. That's where I was at in 2019, laying in the west east end of my house, begging for my life. 25 years sober, no drink, no drug. I'm dying from lust, and I can't get out from under it. But how dark it is before the dawn, because in reality, that's the beginning of my last debauch, and it has been. But look what he says, and I love this. And we're going to hear this word mentioned many times in the big book in the weeks that we move on. But this is the only place in the big book that he's going to give a description of what the fourth dimension is. And here's what he says. I was soon to be catapulted. Man, that's like rocketed into what he likes to call the fourth dimension of existence. So here's the definition for that. I was to know happiness, peace, and usefulness in a way of life, which is incredibly more wonderful as time passes. And if you look at that order, why would happiness and peace come before usefulness? You would think that you would need to be useful to be happy and to, to have peace, right? No, without happiness and peace, there, I'm, I'm not useful to anyone. So this fourth dimension of existence, this third heaven, as, as we've heard it called in other books, this, this place, this is what happens to us as a result of doing this process and awakening from self. And notice it says as time passes, this isn't just like right now for all of us. That's what we want. And this is what's happened to him. But sometimes it, it, it's of the educational variety. It happens as time passes. So this is a wonder, wonderful part of the book. He's bottomed out. He drinks again. That's a wonderful thing. But he's about to get sober and not only get sober, he's about to recover. The same thing happened for me in 94, and it happened again in 2019. There's hope here, guys. Stay with us. Hmm. Thanks for sharing your hope and experience and strength there, David. Love it. Nikki, talk to us a little bit about some of the things that you take away from and and pull out of the reading that we just did. Well, I'm just smiling ear from me, ear to ear because it's just this is just so exciting. And as David just said, if you're just listening or you're new in program or you're new to this lifestyle, stick around because it becomes incredible. And uh, so where we started reading here, declining moral and bodily health, you know, I circled that and put a line out because I didn't want to be like my mom. You know, there's a story in the back of the book called Grounded, and it's about a Native um, American, and he didn't want to be like his indigenous parents, and he wound up just like them. I did not want to be like my mother, declining moral and bodily health, and I wound up just like that. You know, and then a despairing wife. The people we hurt, I hurt everybody, my despairing children, everybody. You know, it's just, it's just awful what we do. And where it says welcome the idea, I put me too. And I'm not talking about the 2022 or 20 Me Too movement. I'm talking about I want to die. I want to die, but I'm too afraid to live. And that is a devastating blow because don't you know who I am? I mean, I've built up this persona, just like Bill W. I have this persona, this ego, my pride, you know, and where it says I thought so well of myself and all these things. It's like, that's all delusion. That's all exactly what David said. I can't differentiate. I mean, my attic life is the only normal one. And I've cried to people about being lonely. Like, you don't know what it's like. Literally, I would cry to people. And a lot of people would tell me, uh, I've been lonely in my marriage for 20 years, Nikki, so you don't know what it's like. So, I mean, you know, this is, the, this is where I, I, I don't even understand what's going on in the world. Where, where David said in this paragraph, my line says, this is his first surrender. And if you're listening out there, it says, alcohol was my master. I put humans 
are my master. See, what you think of me matters more than anything. What you do to me, what you're going to do for me. See, humans, you validating me, you, uh, the actor who wants to run the whole show is what we're all doing here. And, and that is my master. So I want everyone to ask yourself while you're listening and you're walking, what is your master today? Because that changes. You just heard our friend David. It was, it was alcohol that got lifted and then other things start taking over. And that happened in my case too. So what's your master today? Because whatever has power over me is my master. And that is my human race. Um, and then of course they talk about fear, but right here and everybody, I think if you really are in love with this program and this fellowship, it's like, we all know this line, how dark it is before the dawn. You know, and that's when I was rocketed to God is when I lost my job in COVID. I was just having mediocre recovery. I believed I was sponsoring. I was going through the motions. But when I was rocketed into another dimension is when COVID, it was dark. I lost my job. I couldn't travel. I mean, you name it. I could just get into America in May of this year. That's two and a half years. And, and I just threw myself into this work because I know this book and it tells me later that I'm to throw myself harder into helping other people if sex, love, validation, fantasy, lust is my problem. So I do, this promise is true for me. I know happiness, peace and usefulness when you have nothing in the world. Like I was stripped of everything at the bottom. So I'm just so grateful as I read this because it's incredible. And I, as time passes, I'm like so excited. I'm not afraid. I'm real excited. So I just love to drift out into this. It's like, whoa, miracles. <laughs> Thank you, Nikki. Thank you for sharing that. David, I want to jump in here with a question that I have for you. You, you, you stopped there and talked a little bit about that fourth dimension and, and defined it using the words of the book. Um, I'd love if you gave a few examples in your own life where you see these promises, this fourth dimension in your life, and how you have also seen it in the lives of those that you've worked with. I think that would be really helpful to to build on that and share share with us what that means to you and to others you work with. Man, that is a beautiful question. Thank you. The first time I experienced this fourth dimension was in 1995. Um, I had been sober for one year at that time. I'd lost a son during that uh, time. He had drowned. Uh, just so many things were going on. And I dove into this work with a, a full blood Native American. We'd done some sweat lodge ceremonies. And then he put me into the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I had a fourth dimension experience that was unbelievable. It was life changing. I was rocketed, like he said, into the fourth dimension of existence. I was happy. I was useful. I was all these things that it describes here. Uh, at that time, I didn't know a whole lot about step 10. I didn't know how to keep an eye on the things that would rob me of that. And sure enough, it came back and got me. And as we begin to recover here, other things begin to compete for that recovery. I think Nikki just mentioned that. The bad news is those things usually watch out or went out when we're when we're not on guard. <clears throat> you know, I, I read another book where, uh, you know, the master had asked some of his um, and disciples, could you not even stay awake for one hour? <laughs> and that's kind of how I was. I just couldn't stay awake for an hour, you know. And uh, so anyway, it, it was robbed of me. And although I had many of those experiences throughout the years, there was nothing like the one that would come to me in 2020 after I'd bottomed out in 2019 with 25 years of sobriety. And so <clears throat> and being very active in the rooms, by the way, but living a double life. So, you know, the question for me just isn't you know how do i achieve this fourth dimension do this work wholeheartedly as nikki said it'll come it'll come but the deal is then you don't have to be on guard of anything that comes against my spirit no matter what that is i have to inventory that identify that take ownership of that confess that with somebody else be willing to have it removed in six and seven clean it up and and move back into the dimension and so this is a this is a wonderful process. Um, 
Yeah, it's sure to come to all of us. I think Nikki read that in our last episode at the end of uh, We Agnostics there. Even rightfully so, God has restored us all to our right minds, all of us. So this fourth dimension is here for all of us. Thanks, Justin. <laughs> Love that the 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 room is broad. It's or the, the the path is broad and roomy. I'm trying to remember exactly how that goes, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of room in that fourth dimension. Nobody's going to be excluded if they want it. Love that, Nikki. The question I have for you is one that I think I'm going to ask from my perspective to you. You know, for me in my whole life, it was all about putting forward this this persona that I had built, that I had worked so hard to to have this public persona that was. Um, you know, perfect, that was near perfect, um, you know, and and where I'm going with this is many of the people in the rooms are capable in so many areas. We're, we're smart. We have, we, we look the part in some, so, so often, or, or at least we can talk the part, even if we don't look it. Um, talk to me a little bit about that breaking down and how that how getting honest in those areas has actually helped you and maybe coach me up, say, Hey, Justin, I see this, this in, in you or, or pretend like I'm somebody else, however you want to do that. But talk about that, um, the capability and yet still can't do it on my own. Okay, Justin. Well, let me see if I can answer that. I think people like Nikki M because I'm radically honest. I think that's why my the noodle meeting that you host that Rico 12 uh is I'm so grateful to Rico 12 for hosting that service meeting and um you know 165 people are usually coming out every Monday because they like to see the reality of what's really going on see it asks us here rarely have we seen a person fail who thoroughly follows our path thoroughly is really being honest and 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 you know we're we're trying to get into this this new dimension and you just said it i had built this per, this perfect public persona i have no problems look at me and 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 i and i had all this, this these these things and this 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 fake news surrounding me but when i got vulnerable with people people got vulnerable with me you know in in our book in to the wives it says let me just get there on page 117 no, I lie. It's on page 118. It says, show him. And they're talking to the wives, to the husbands. But I'm going to ask everybody here, show the human race these things. What things, Nikki? Well, the sentence says, patience, tolerance, understanding, and love are the watchwords. Show these things to people in yourself, and they will be reflected back to you from them. So if I get vulnerable, people get vulnerable with me. When I started getting radically honest with people and let go of those, that, that fake, that fake Nikki and really got into this child of God who needs, I need people. I need you. We, not me. You know, it says here on page 25, cause we're talking about the fourth dimension and they talk about it on page 25 where it says, no one likes the self searching. None of us liked the self-searching. None of us liked the leveling of our pride or the confession of our shortcomings, which the process requires for its successful consummation. None of us like that. But see, we have to do this. I have to come in here and toe the line because it says, we saw that it really works in others. So we had to come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as I had been living. So I have to sweep away this old persona and I have to get radically honest. It's not fun to come on. It took me a while even to post my podcast on Facebook because I don't want my family and friends to know that I am a sex and love addict. There's nothing fun about that. It's cooler to say, Nikki, I'm a heroin freak. <laughs> but that you know that's more acceptable because people think that I'm out there doing things that shouldn't even be mentioned ever. But that's not what it is. What does it look like? I want you to validate me. I want you to love me. I want to take one person hostage until I can make you see how wonderful I am, which is all lies. So I guess the truth is, if you're coming in here, you really have to take off that superhero outfit and you need to get into that little manger and say, help me, people. I need you. And I'm not afraid to do that anymore. Thank mm -hmm. you, Justin. Thank you, Nikki. Uh 
Very nice. Thank you. Thank you both for your insights on that. Let's uh, let's jump in and just take do a takeaway. Uh, David, what's a quick takeaway from our our conversation we've had today for you? Well, no matter where we're at in the process, or where we're at in our spiritual walk, the takeaway for me is without the solution, the problem is going to always, always be, it's just always going to have the power in my life. So when I read what we've read today, they're on page eight, where Bill sobered up and, you know, he had no solution then we always drink or do whatever it is again. So I don't know if I'm going to take anything away from what, what what we've looked at here today. It's one, I'm powerless. And if that's the truth, then power must be the answer that's found in our second step. If insanity is driving me back out the door to do whatever it is against my will, then sanity has to be the answer. And so step two becomes the answer to the entire program for me. But without the other 10 steps, it's no longer a solution. I drift back into the problem. And then whatever it is, once again, becomes my master. So I I always take that away and keep that in my consciousness. Uh, step two without any action is just a belief. I can believe something all day long unless I take action based on that belief. It's just a belief. So. That's what I'm taking with me as I leave from here. Stay in the solution. The problem will, it'll disappear. It just will. Thanks, Justin. Thank you, David, for that testimonial. Nikki, what's the takeaway for you? Well, that I'm never alone in my loneliness and despair that uh, 80 years ago or 100 years ago, some guy named Bill W. felt the same way. He was lonely and filled with despair. And I want all our listeners out there, please, every morning, ask yourself, what is your master today? What is your master? Because love can be your master. Being responsible, being humble, being kind, being forgiving. And if you're in the thick of it and you are in the dark, okay, it's dark before the dawn, everybody, but you're you're listening to three children of God who are literally living happiness, peace, and usefulness in this way of life. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. My takeaway is, is pretty similar to what you, you shared there. Um, you know, I something is going to be my master today. Something is going to be my master this next five minutes. And if that that if my master is not my higher power, is not a godly principle of love, of patience, of of of, of helpfulness. Uh, my master is going to be, well, alcohol. Alcohol was my master or whatever it is, is going to be my master. Fear, anger, uh, resentment, that is going to be my master. And I want to choose good. Thank you so much, David and Nikki, for your uh, insights, for your conversation, for your experience, strength, and hope. Really appreciate that. For those of you out here listening to us, Go and uh, check out the other RICO 12 projects that we have going on. Go and see what uh, David's got going on in his in his recovery work and Nikki, what she's got going on in her recovery work. And they're all in the show notes of the podcast. Keep coming back, everybody. What we've got going here is something that is helping us and we are sure or, and we hope that it is also helping you out there. Work it. You are worth it. <laughs>